Alan McCock has a um, Master's of Science in Physics. He worked on the Sudbury Neutrino Experiment, SNO. SNO was run by Arthur McDonald, who recently won the Nobel Prize in Physics. Sadly, Alan got, only got one published paper out of the process. He's now a computer consultant and has written multiple internet standards. He's been interested in skepticism for a long time, and he has found his physics training invaluable in the skeptical process. So this, this is what people know of as the scientific method, right? You have your process. You ask a question, you have the hypothesis, you do an experiment, you analyze it, and then you communicate the results to others. Well, that's a scientific method that doesn't apply to the larger world, doesn't describe the larger world. So what is science and the scientific method really based on? Um, it, the scientific method is applied by people, so we want to know how that affects the practice of their work. They're not just stuck in a lab somewhere working all by themselves. They talk to other people. So what principles are they applying when they do the science thing, right? It's not, again, it's not just a scientific method. And what problem are we trying to avoid as scientists? And the problem we're trying to avoid is I'm lying to you, right? I'm human. You have no idea what, whether or not what I say is true. So how do you know? Even worse, I'm lying to myself. I believe what I say even though it's complete crap. And so in the larger scientific community, how do you deal with that? How do you achieve truth when everyone is lying? Part of the problem is people are imperfect. Reading opposing views is painful, right? If you're liberal, you don't watch Fox News because those people are terrible. If you watch Fox News, you don't watch any of that liberal stuff because it's, it's evil. So what you can do is you can rely on not just the scientific method, but the overall practices and principles. If someone else is right, he's going to prove himself right. You don't need to work with that. If he's wrong, we can ignore him. It doesn't matter. So one of my favorite stories related to this is the story of the emperor has no clothes. So all these people write all these treatises about how beautiful and wonderful the emperor's clothes are. You, you, you don't need to read any of that. If it's right, they will prove it right. If it's wrong, you can ignore it. What you need to do is examine your own viewpoint. Um, for people who know Mr. Deity, he recently had a video where he talks about this, and he said he was a Mormon, he had questions, and one of the principles he had was he would be honest with himself. So he didn't examine anything else. He examined the roots of his beliefs. And after a while, he realized he could no longer agree with his beliefs. So what does all this mean? Science is about discovering truth while living in a web of lies and delusion. The practices and principles of science help us to avoid our human failings because we can't all be crazy. We can't all be crazy about everything. My pet thing that I'm crazy about, you can be rational about. And the thing that you like, I can be rational about. And between that, between a common process, we can agree on a common reality. Some of the philosophical principles of science are content versus authority, style versus substance, and belief versus facts. So content versus authority. I don't know if most people know the name Noam Chomsky. He is the leading intellectual of our time, quoted, um, I think, more than almost anyone, more than anyone else alive. And the only people or things quoted more than him are like the Bible and Aristotle and things like that. So Noam Chomsky goes to certain unnamed conferences and gets sneered at. Oh, right. You didn't study under Professor Smith at Brown University. We don't have to pay attention to what you have to say. 
He goes to other conferences, specifically science math ones. No one cares that his degree is in linguistics. They want to know whether or not what he says makes sense. So that's the content versus authority. Charles Darwin. Everyone applauds Charles Darwin for what he did. I don't know if you know about his personal life. He was married for 27 years, left his wife for like an 18-year-old, and then started writing crap about his wife, calling her all kinds of names. He's a bit of an asshole. But how many people have spent 25 years writing a thousand-page book doing all the research in the area that we're still doing more research on based on what he did 100, 120 years ago? So his content matters. We applaud people because what they say is true, not because of who they studied under or any divine revelation. Style versus substance. Science papers are written to have minimal style. We use the widget to measure the frobby jabber to be five. What does that mean? I don't know, right? But the sentence structure is simple. Richard Feynman, physicist, has a comment about reading some papers outside science. He has this one sentence which has just confused him in this paper. And the sentence was, occasionally people obtain information through visually perceptible forms. And he sort of scratched his head and thought about it for a while. What does that mean? And it means people read. And once he figured this out, he went through the whole paper and there's these huge long sentences which are really saying not much of anything, which is style, right? I can talk philosophy and all kinds of complicated things and if the style is complicated, it's probably hiding something. Whereas in science papers, the style is very, very simple because they don't want to rely on rhetoric. They don't want to rely on, you know, the kinds of things that these um, self-help guys do, right? They run around shouting at the crowd, working up the crowd. If their stuff worked, they wouldn't have to rely on style. They would just say, do this and you'll be rich. See, it's that easy. Substance can be verified by others. Style can't. You might have style and I don't. So style doesn't work for me. But we can both rely on a common substance. Beliefs versus facts. My belief won't convince you. Why should it? They're, it's important to me, not to you. Sacred truths in science are anathema. Everything can be questioned. Even gravity can be questioned for a short period of time until you hit the ground, right? <laughs> Facts can be verified by others. The scientific method, I can communicate an experiment. We can each pick up a small object and drop it. We can independently verify that gravity is true. That if I tell you the story of gravity or any other science idea, you can independently verify it's true. So the scientific practice involves asking a few key questions. How do you know? Someone tells me something. How do you know? Or someone tells me something else. What does that mean? I mean, one of the key ones in science, how can I do it? Right? If you tell me a story and I can't do it, it doesn't mean anything. How do you know? People love stories, right? Movies, books, novels. The problem is stories have emotional impact even when they're false. So going back to history, Right? There's all kinds of stories that uh, people tell each other in the Middle Ages. You know, one of, the, one of the terrible ones, Jews eat Christian babies. Well, how do you know? Right? It's a story that everyone tells everyone else. Asking how you know get at, gets at the facts behind the stories. What does that mean is another one. Numbers are just data. They have no meaning. That, that, that's a big problem when you read you know, newspaper headlines. So many people killed. So many, you know, a so, certain percentage of people committing a particular crime. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a number. The meaning comes from the explanations of the numbers, the theoretical model behind it. 
So, for example, if you look at what physicists do, physicists are aware of the capability of self-delusion. CERN, when they discovered the Higgs boson, um, this was a couple years ago, they had their theoretical model of what it should be. They had their data analysis model. One of the things they did is they were aware of the potential for self-delusion in feedback loops. We write our data analysis, we do the data analysis, we come up with, oh, I don't like that number, right? It, it's not quite what I thought it should be. I'm just gonna go tweak my analysis until we get the correct number. Well, you can't do that. They're aware of the capability for self-delusion, and they had a rule. They write all the analysis, and once they start, all their analysis is untouched, unchanged. And whatever number comes out at the end, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, that's the number that they published. Because they're aware of their capability of self-delusion. So how can I do it? Right? My experience in physics was everything I taught, I'm sorry, everything I was taught up until grad school was here's this theory, and now don't believe me. Do the experiment yourself. At one point when I was in grad school, I was at a grad student party and someone from a non-science discipline was talking to me about physics and was saying, oh, but you know, um, in physics, they just teach you and you have to believe what they say. And I had to explain very slowly to this person that might be what happened in your discipline. That's not what happens in my discipline. I was taught from day one, don't believe me. Do the experiment yourself. What that means is anytime someone questions physics, anytime someone questions my experience, I don't have a response like it's a sacred belief, you know, you're denying the reality of Jesus, and I, you know, oh my God, that's terrible, right? Instead, it comes across a bit more like, um, if I can ask a Diana question, which high school did you go to? No, which one? Sorry? Yeah, no you didn't, right? And if someone says that, your response is, what? It's confusion. It's not this, oh, they're lying to me. It's, no, no, this is my life. This is what I did. Everything I did in physics. I experienced. So when people question it, it's like, what are you talking about? Get out, right? So when you ask, how can I do it? It lets you know if the belief is based on a shared reality or is a personal belief that may not be real at all. And another example from physics is before they had computer analysis, they would have film footage, 70 millimeter film footage from cloud chambers. And these, basically the, the pictures would have spirals and all kinds of other things on them. And you would look for new things that you hadn't seen before. So the physicists would not look at these pictures. They would not have graduate students look at these pictures because they would see what they wanted to see. So who looked at the pictures? And the answer is, they would hire grandmothers. Because these people had lots of spare time, right? You could train them, here's what I want to see. If you see something like this, this is unusual. They did not have beliefs about physics, so what they saw was what was actually there. Whereas the physicists had beliefs about physics and therefore could not look at the pictures because their beliefs would make them see things that weren't there. So in summary, the scientific method is just one part of science. The practices and principles, the, the, the social agreement, social convention around science is also important. And ultimately, asking simple questions is, is really the basis of science. So that's it, thank you. Uh, 
Do you have any uh, concrete suggestions on how to decide whether it's worth funding splits in hypotheses and that sort of thing? How how you decide how you want to one hypothesis and another one, including one, three or four? How you, how you, um, that's unfortunately personal preference, right? A lot of it, it's, it's how can you decide where you should be spending the time, money, effort on hypothesis A or hypothesis B? Um, the only answer that really seems to work is um, you have everyone fight over it. Um, it, it's politics, it's evolution, it's survival of the fittest. Um, the one thing which people are careful to do is to make as few claims as possible. So, while we know now that the fundamental particles in physics are quarks, for example, there actually was a guy, and I believe the uh, mid-60s who came up with a theoretical model to explain physics and said there are these three things, he didn't call them quarks, he had a mathematical model which described more of reality than the current ones at the time and he said, he made the key mistake of saying and this is real and for that because there was not so much proof that it was real he got drummed out of physics and a while later everyone went oh, yeah sorry about that we were wrong um, it's hard. I mean, deciding which hypothesis to go on, you can't have a scientific method to determine which one is better. Any other questions? Sure. So everyone's okay with me lying to you the whole time? All right. Thank you.